Hi, I'm uh, Bob Fletcher, connecting an interview today with Tommy Jarrett. Uh, and we're at the uh, Vernal University's uh, Northeast Georgia History Center, located in Gainesville, Georgia. Anyway, this is conducted for the Library of Congress uh, Veterans Project. Our coordinator here is, and with us today is Helen Martin. Uh, she's also with the DAR uh, in uh, Gainesville, active in, as part of this project. Uh, we have Mike Smith as our videographer. And, uh, you know, Tommy, I, 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 let me get the uh, date pinned down on this so we have a really good day. This is the 16th of July, 2022. And, of course, we are here in Gainesville, Georgia, at this uh, beautiful Northeast uh, History Center, sponsored by Bernal University. Uh, Tommy, I don't know you very well, so if you don't mind, uh, we'd like to begin with maybe where and, uh, you know, what, what year you were born and where you're from. Okay. <clears throat> I'm from North Carolina. I was born in Hayesville, North Carolina, which is a little town in the mountains, actually due north of Gainesville here. It's only about an hour and a half drive uh, from here. Uh, I live in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where my family and I reside. Goldsboro is about 50 miles east of Raleigh. Hmm. And Goldsboro it reminds me of a place up there, maybe an Air Force Base somewhere around there. Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. That's, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe we can get a little bit about your background in terms of your early data, uh, bio, uh, biographical. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, who are your parents and uh, maybe where they were born or what their occupations were. Maybe if you have any siblings that were in the military. No, 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 no siblings in the military. I'll tell you, I got, had five uncles I'll tell you briefly about. Uh, born in, well, I said Hayes. Well, actually, I'm too rural for Hayesville. I was born outside Hayesville on a farm, lived on a farm, uh, experienced the good life it provided and the hard work it required. It was father, uh, my father owned the farm and I was his uh, employee. One day <laughs> I was explaining how it was working on the farm and this lady said to me, said, did you have any migrants? I said, you're looking at him. I, <laughs> I, I, I was the migrant. You're so. migrant. Hard work, uh, then uh, went to, uh, graduated from high school in 1961, uh, went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, undergraduate and law school, graduated from law school in 1967. Uh, my wife and I, as I said, live in Goldsboro. We have uh, three children, five grandchildren. Wow, huge family. And that's a beautiful area of the country. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, basically, uh, what were you, well, you just covered that a little bit, but what were you doing maybe just maybe the year before, not the uh, terms of college, but what you were doing just before you got in the service? Okay. Uh, long story. Uh, when I went to Chapel Hill in the fall of 1961, I, I had two goals. Uh, one, I wanted to be a lawyer. Don't ask me why. I know person in my family has ever been a lawyer. I'm first. Went off that farm to be a lawyer. <laughs> well, that, that farm will make a lawyer out of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, so I went over to the, uh, they call it the Naval Observatory building. I uh, went over there and, uh, I, and the other goal I had, I wanted to be a Marine officer. Don't ask me why. Uh, no, no member of my family has ever been in the Marines. At any, at any rate, I went over there and there, uh, there was a Marine recruiter there, and I asked about signing up for Naval ROTC, and I explained to him what I wanted to do, and he said, we can't accommodate you. He said, we've got this thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the Marine Corps has got this thing called the PLC program, P P P Platoon Leaders Class. I've seen it referred to as Platoon Leaders Course, but Platoon Leaders Class, I think it was the proper term, where you can... Uh, uh, every year the Marines select a few officers to be lawyers. So if you qualify for all that, you can go to Quantico one summer or two summers, go through PLC, which is the same thing as OCS. Uh, then you go to law school. If you pass a bar exam, then you come back in the Marine Corps as a lawyer with a three-year commitment. So that looked like a pretty good plan that fit my uh, plans. And so that's what I did after my, uh, I guess it would be my, the, the summer before I entered law school, 
I went to Quantico, Virginia and went through the training that all Marine officers have to go through. Yeah. Nobody gets a free pass in the Marines. Very difficult program. No, not, yes sir, nobody gets a free pass. The aviators, they don't get a free pass. Artillery, no free pass. Lawyers, same no free, thing. same deal. Everybody has to go through the... All of the weapons and everything. Else. Everything. Then, once you become a, a, once you graduate from there and you get your undergraduate degree, which I got, uh, you go back, you start all over, but you're working on your three-year obligation. But the first thing you do, you go back to what's called the basic school, not basic training, but it's called the TBS, the basic school, which is a six months program for lieutenants. Oh. Then you go through it all again. It's not as bad on you. Uh, there's no harassment, uh, not as much physical. Uh, I won't use the word abuse. I might create a scandal. Uh, so by being a lawyer, you actually had to do that twice in a way. Everybody did. Oh, everybody did. Everybody. Oh, Pilots. So it's a double back and forth. Absolutely. Oh, I see. So now I'm back. I'm a lieutenant now. And the war was going on then, so they cut about a month off of it. It used to be, I think, six months. And then when I went back, it was five months. And you go back, as you, 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 you got it right, you start out with the basic, the way it was then, the basic, uh, infantry unit in the Marine Corps was called a fire team, consists of four members. Mm -hmm. Three fire teams in a squad consists of 12 members. Three squads in a platoon. What would the rank of the squad leader be? Squad leader would be, he would be a corporal, he'd be a E3. Mm -hmm. the, the, well, I'm talking about a fully manned Platoon now. Yes. Many of many times they and were the not. Platoon leader would be maybe a lieutenant or a captain. The platoon leader would be a lieutenant. Platoon sergeant would be an E6. Mm -hmm. And there was another sergeant. I don't know what that I can re recall his name. He would have been an E4. He he. And then you had your. You had your uh, the squad, each squad leader would have been an E4, and on down the line, and and that fire team would would consisted of privates and PFCs mainly. Some of those memories of those uh, men there at the early days really stand out still. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How did it help you in your law practice, you think? Gosh, uh, uh, some people say I'm too aggressive as a lawyer. That's maybe, what they said. And I, I don't know whether you, I can blame that on the Marines or not, and I don't know whether it's true or not. Some people might say I'm too passive as a lawyer. I don't know how that... Let blame. me ask you this about your uh, decision. When you... Uh, you did not have to be, you were drafted and you didn't enlist because you're an officer. You went through the officer program. Right. Uh, you didn't have to go into the military. You could have not gone into the military. No, I had to go. You had to go. Because I'd made a, that no, commitment. No, I mean, uh, that was 1961, wasn't it, when you made the original? No, it would have been a little later. At 61 is when I learned about the PLC program, then the 62, 63, six, about 64. In there, I, I could have got probably gotten a deferment. I was thinking because '64, you were uh, that war was on almost. Especially, it got really big in 1965 when we, the United States, in effect, took over the war. It was about to September of '65, if I'm right. I think you're probably remembering right. Remembering of the history. I think you're probably right. I remember it's 1965. The Marines were the first. Exactly. Probably. Landed at a place called Red Beach at Da Nang. Da Nang walked up on the beach. That is correct. Yes, I remember the TV shows. Yeah, the, yeah. The girls putting the layouts on and everything. It wasn't like D Day. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It, was, <laughs> it was not like D Day. But again, I think I don't. I don't. Did I think you had to actually uh, go to the military if you didn't want to, but you chose that kind of. I did. Very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. And I think it does have something with you. Maybe. Well, I don't, I don't know about that, know. but anyhow, well, that's, that's, that's how it happened. That, you know, that kind of really is a great look at you in those early days. I know that stands out. I, mean, I don't know who could go through Paris Island and not remember it, but. I, I didn't have to go through Paris Island, went through Quantico. Quantico, right. Paris well, Island is Lejeune, I guess. All right. Paris Island is over in Beaufort, South Carolina. It is for the enlisted Marines in the old days when I was there. It was for all enlisted Marines east of the Mississippi. On the west coast, the boot camp, as they call it, was at, uh, come on, Tommy, 
Yeah, well, there's a place, there's a Paris Island in California. San, maybe San Diego. Or? San Diego. You're right on. You're you're good. You're you're running ahead. Just guessing. What's no, you got it right. I have no clue about the marina. San, San Diego. That's the one for for people then, west of the Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense with the big naval base there. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Uh, let's see if we can cover all. I think we've covered everything prior to your, you know, all of your background, but. Uh, so we know you were in the Marines uh, right away. We know about your how you got in, about the training program there at uh, Quantico. You know a lot about those instructors and drill instructors, and you just I, I know I, I I don't remember names real well. I remember the name of we didn't call them drill instructors; we called them platoon sergeants. Oh. I remember the name of mine quite well. I won't mention his name, <laughs> and it's a name. Uh, that I, that I do not look upon with much kindness. I was he, going to ask but he, you that. <laughs> but, but he has he had a job to do, and let me say he did it quite well. I, 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 I was not going to push that, but I was going to ask if you had any uh, thoughts about some of those early uh, people that trained you. <laughs> so that's really a few thoughts, yes. So you think he adapted pretty well all that? I hope. Coming off that farm? Yeah, I hope I did. Well, now we're going to get into the wartime uh, okay. service. Okay, so all right. You are now an officer in the Marine Corps. You're a lawyer. Yes. Uh, where were your first station? Good question. <clears throat> after I got, after I went back and I went through Quantico again, that six, that TBS, for lieutenants, that all inf all law, uh, Marines officers have to go through. <clears throat> then the, they sent me to Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that that was that was like six weeks. That was like a military law school, if you want to. Was uh, that in the right in the Naval War College, maybe, where you went to school, or was it a separate building? It was separate. Mm -hmm. It was separate. Yeah, uh, but it was uh, it's very good, very good uh, training. Useful, not only in the military but uh, yeah. otherwise. As you know, I guess uh, that court martial system is maybe you do need to go to six weeks to get a. Look and how that might look compared to what you learned at Chapel Hill. Yeah, well, uh, the as it turns out today, it wasn't so then. As it turns out today, at least in North Carolina, and and the federal courts and now the military all use the same basic rules of evidence. Obviously, some differences for different venues, different avenues. Uh, you you would not have the, for for example, one difference, and I, and I understand it's still a difference, is there's a uh, doctor-patient privilege doesn't apply in the military. Anything you tell, if... And we if, did if, not know, I did not know that. If, if, as I understand, if the rule hasn't changed, I don't think it has, what you tell the doctor is... It's very interesting. Free game, that's... Is yeah. that maybe the one difference? That's that. That would be one of the differences. <clears throat> also, of course, in civilian life, you have a jury of twelve people. Where in court martials, you have a jury of a panel of three people for a special court martial, and, and five people at least for a general court martial. You got got those differences. But the rules of evidence are today are basically the same. Now, now you got that uh, great training in college and your legal background and it's running around maybe like let's say 1967 uh, what, what, when did you arrive in uh, Vietnam and what base was it and how did your uh, legal uh, background relate to the wartime service what, what, what did you see and what did you what did you do okay when you <clears throat> when you first got to Vietnam good question uh, I, I have joked about this I got I got my orders I'll tell you two two jokes about it there, look it up. There was a horse running in the Kentucky Derby in 1969. I was at Camp Lejeune then. After after Newport, Rhode Island, I was down at Camp Lejeune. There was a horse running in the Kentucky Derby that year called Arts and Letters. Arts and Letters was the favorite. I remember that. <laughs> he didn't win the Derby, but he won the Preakness and the Belmont. He was a great horse. And I wish he had won the tri Triple Crown, but he didn't. And that's the day I got my my letters to go to Vietnam. And I've often said, if that horse's name had been Stateside, had a name Stateside or 
<laughs> something other than arts and letters. Anyway, just a joke. And that's when I got my orders to Vietnam. That's funny. And I left, and another small smile joke, if you will, on July the 4th, 1969, and I've quipped that only patriots go to war on July the 4th. I'm just an accident, of course, but anyway. So that's when I left. And one thing about it was, I did get a tour of the Pacific, because we flew over there in a stretch eight. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether you know what a stretch eight is. Commercial or a DC eight commercial. Commercial. And what it, it, the, the stretch eight was a forerunner of the jumbo jet, as the name indicates. They just yeah. stretched it to get more people on there. Leaving, so that, leaving from where on the west coast? Good question. Left from uh, that air base north of San Francisco. It'll come to me. Flew to Hawaii. Oh, that's Travis Air Force Base. Travis, Travis. You, yeah. you're, you're good. Travis Air Force Base. Flew to Hawaii. Flew to Wake Island. Flew to Guam. Flew up to Okinawa. Now, as an aside, meaning nothing, but it actually meant something to me. We were on that leg of that flight going from uh, Guam up to Okinawa, and the pilot came on the intercom and he said, well, where are we? I don't know where we are. And of course, you know, we knew he knew. <laughs> Sounded good sign, Tom. Well, we, we knew that he knew. And he said, you know. Maybe he did. <laughs> well, he did. Uh, he, he proved that he did. Uh, he said, you know, I've got a load of Marines on here. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to fly by Iwo Jima. Oh, beautiful. And by golly, he did. You know, you actually had a, a tour of World War II. I, I did. I went to, and, and we flew by Iwo Jima, and we flew on the, over the, that would have been the, in Mount Suribachi. Suribachi. And it was at the side next to us. Uh, as, in Marine or Naval terminology, it was on the port side of the plane, left side. And uh, you could see down there, you could see the island. And I understand it's, it's, it's uh, much different today, but this was 1969, <clears throat> not that far after the war, actually, when you think about it. But there was one green spot, it was all brown. There was one green spot, which I presume was the cemetery. Hmm. Well. And there was one boat moored down there which I presume was a tour boat. It looked like a tour boat. Not one of the great big ones you see, but a smaller version. He rolled it over so you could take a look. Huh? And not only that, he, he, he banked it up a little bit. Where How you many Marines do you think were on that aircraft? Every one, you, every jelly bean you could get in the can was in that in that plane. And I was sitting in the back. I was way back there. Yeah. Well, that's what... Whatever, whatever. I don't remember my history here. The 69, right about then, would be Nixon still actively working on that war rather than uh, re reducing troops. We, we'll get to that in a minute. There was no, there was no withdrawal then. No withdrawal then. And everybody was going. Uh, ever, everybody that you can get on a stretch eight was on that stretch eight, I promise what you. What type of uniform did you have on you? Was it combat? No. Mm -mm. Regular? Regular khaki, khaki uniform, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we landed in Okinawa. We stayed in Okinawa two or three days. That's the only place I've ever been when in the daytime, I stood there and watched a cloud come by. I'd never seen a cloud in daytime. It's about as big as a car <laughs> and it just came floating. And I, I just stood there and watched that cloud. You know, I don't know why I remember that, but I did. I just never seen. How old were you at this time? I was old, so remember, I'd been to law school. Yeah. I was 20, let's say 25. Maybe, maybe uh, one of the older people on that whole Marine Corps group. Exactly, yeah. yeah. They were probably young kids, 18, 19 maybe? You got it. Wow. You got it. Well, when you left Okinawa, how'd you get into Vietnam? Took another plane. Military or commercial? Commercial. That's Flew something to war. Absolutely. And the reference point, they would fly from Okinawa. They, I, I was watch, following what they were doing because I made another flight in there up, up and back one other time. And they would fly to the tip of Taiwan. Okay. 
Yeah, that was that was that was a reference point. They'd fly to the tip of Taiwan and then they'd make a turn and So you landed then probably with Danang? Danang. Landed at Danang and uh somehow I got to my assignment, I don't know exactly, but which was up the beach there a little ways. Let me ask you this, when you looked out when you were you in a barracks type operation, officers quarters or We lived in what we called hooches. Hooches. Hooch that a hooch was a hut. Yeah. Uh, hut with uh, like a tent almost, or a better than a tent. Metal roof maybe, or metal roof. Uh, Hooch had uh, ten guys. Uh, these are and these are all officers mm -hmm. quartered yes. together. Correct. So that uh, you, uh, how did it feel? When you first uh, looked around on it, hey, I'll, I'll tell you how it felt. I'll tell you exactly how it felt. Right, right, that that moment there in Vietnam. Oh uh, well, then you're kind of, ooh, you're kind of. Yeah, '69. Though you saw all what happened to that war when you were looking at TV. Right. You you were kind of edgy, but I'll tell you what would really got got us edgy. Not being accustomed to it at night when they'd fire that naval gunfire, out off the coast. Boom, and those those shells would go over, and they would go 30 miles, I guess. I don't know how far they went, but uh, I was totally not expecting naval gunfire at night. Boy, when it went off that first two or three times, I thought this 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 is the big one. That's but not it, a good introduction. Well, it's not. <laughs> but I mean, that's the way it was. Then then there's the joke. Here's the joke they play on everybody who's new. I don't remember how I reacted to it, but. We had there. We had these bunkers. You could come, run and jump in if you came under attack. And they didn't tell you that at noon. They told you in the whole area if there was an attack, a siren would go off. Large. You could hear it forever, a long way. They didn't tell you though that that it went off every day at noon. <laughs> so you're sitting there. You're having your first meal, and the thing siren goes off, and you say, "Oh no." Sometimes guys would run and jump in the bunkers, you know, to get to Dude, hide from. Watch that with you. <laughs> I don't think I ran and jumped in a bunker, but I tell you what, my heart skipped one or two beats. That, that from first meal wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it couldn't have been very good after that when that siren went off. Yeah. Well, let me ask you. Did so you're uh, and you were in some type of probably a building where the a court or a court, and then you had to. Do, you had to take cases of active duty and exactly. what they did wrong and right. Exactly. Uh, Prosecute. And, and, and all while you're doing this, you're hearing wartime like fighter jets going taken off. All the time. Fighter you jets. heard the fire from the ocean. And, yeah. Uh, were you tense or just kind of did you? Well, after a while, you want, you're not tense. Just get into it. But I will say this. Uh, hey, look, I had a desk job. I was, and I want it on the record. I was not a warrior and I was not a hero. The warriors of the 68,000 that died, and, or 58,000, and the ones that were wounded, and those that uh, distinguished themselves in combat, they're the heroes. I, am, I was not. Uh, but I will say this, if combat is 100% terror, and I imagine that it is, where I was, it was like 10% terror. There was always a little a little specter, if you will, hanging over the... Oh yeah, the, the, I'm sure there was. You're, well, you're in a war zone. That's true. I mean, that's, you got combat pay and tax exemption. That is, that is true. That is don't, a, didn't say I earned it, but I got it, yes. Oh well, uh, that, don't, don't apologize. Yes. You put your life on the line and you were there. Well, I was there. And anything, that base could have been hit at any time, I assume. The Marines were there, of course, or in the I'm sure by that time they had that thing guarded, maybe? Yeah, they had a, had a perimeter. And uh, <clears throat> every now and then, one time that I remember distinctly, I think it happened twice, the, I guess it was either the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese, anyway, it was the enemy, tried to penetrate the, our perimeter. And uh, the long and short of it was they brought in a gunship and uh, it was, Going around, they had that thing tilted up. And back then, that they got, they still have that gunship, but it's much more mechanized now. It, it uses a computer and it's got a nozzle 
back then what they did, if they had a door cut in the, in the side of that KC-130, and they had a guy standing up there, he was belted in, you could see him, and he had like a Gatling gun in that door, and he was putting fire down on those guys. And there were bullets flying around it, but that was friendly stuff. But a, a friendly bullet, it still worked. When, when it when it hits you between the eyes, you've been hit, regardless. So, but then we had a rocket attack, at least one rocket attack that I remember. The enemy had a this this was primitive, an old Chinese rocket, and uh, the diameter was about like that, and uh, it was about ceiling high, about. 15 feet high, 12, 15 feet high. In the end, the front end, it had a warhead. In the middle, it had its fuel supply. And in the back end, it had had a crude engine. And when it went over, I've heard one or two of them, it sounded like a train running around, you being in a, under a tr train trestle and a train going over. That's the way it sounded. And, and they would go over. And the way they, they just aimed it, and tried to guess the amount of fuel that they needed to carry it down to where we were. They'd aim that thing and they would it'd go off and it, when it went over the top of your head, it was making a racket. Then there was a, a eerie one second of silence. Because that meant it had gone as far as it was going to go and it was coming down. And then when it hit, boom, made a but big racket, big hole in the I think you have to apologize for not being in a war zone. Well, well, anyway, that's the way that thing was. It made a lot of racket at a quiet, when the, when the fuel shut off, and boom, that's the way that thing worked. I was going to ask you, uh, I, we couldn't possibly go into it all, but uh, how long was the tour, and maybe what was the one case you remember from your... Your time there. I can I can tell you I can answer both of those uh, easily. Uh, pr uh, prosecuted and defended Marines who violated the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, much of that code is just like the criminal law in every state in the United States. Uh, and the case that I defended was a murder case. I've never understood exactly what happened, but the these guys were out, they were late to get back to the base. They thumbed a ride, hitched a ride, with a dump truck. They were in the back of a marine dump truck, and for some reason, it was never explained to me, they decided to fire their weapons, which is violates, that's a violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. For no reason. For, for no, you, don't, you don't lock and load that weapon unless you mean business. Right. They had no business firing that. So three but you, of them. But you had to defend them. And it one of them. There were, there were three in the back of that truck. Mm -hmm. Two of them pulled the trigger, fired up. The third one, whom I represented, his story was just just like that, except he said he turned and it, and his rifle hit the, the back of the cab of the truck and it fired down into a group of children. And the result was not good. Yeah. Uh, one child dead, another child's arm that's blown tough, off. That's a case to handle. That's, that's terrible. It was easier than it would be today since I've got grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Very tough case to handle, though. Tough case. How old was the young man? Remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember his name. I'm gonna tell you his name. I remember his name just like that. Some names that you can't forget. He probably was 19, 20. That's that's close. And he, I'll tell you the state he was from. No, I won't tell you. I'll just say he was from the southwestern United States. That's where it was from. I won't tell you his name. No, no, you don't have to go into that. Uh, but anyhow. This is, but that, how did, I, uh, can I ask you how it came out? Just briefly. Okay, here, here was the deal. We went to trial, and our defense was accident. The, all right. They they were going for the death penalty. They, the United States government, said it was premeditated, and they wanted the death penalty. That's the way they started. The government started out. Well, our position was it was accident. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there was another jeep coming along with Koreans. We had Korean people. 
uh, Koreans over there. Uh, they were down at a place called Hoi An. So I went looking for the Koreans. And okay. so I got on a CH-46 helicopter. I went down there. I went into that place. And to say I was nervous would be an understatement. I was the only Western person there. And there was a three-star Korean general sitting behind that desk. And I had their statements written in, it was written in Korean. I couldn't read or speak Korean. Those guys couldn't speak English. I went in there and I saluted that, that general. And I tried to tell him who I was, why I was there, and, and he didn't want anything to hear from me. No he blew me off like I was a spider on the, on the desk or something. But there was one Korean lieutenant who understood enough to tell me that the guys you're looking for are back in Da Nang. So I've gone down there on a wild, wild goose chase. That was correct. Didn't work out. The, 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 well, because of that, we look, we found out where they were. So at least one Korean come back and, and, and described what he saw. And he said he saw two Marines fire up, one Marine fire down. Hmm. That took the execution out. So. Can we ask you what the, uh decision was? Yes, I'm, I'm getting to that. Here's, here, was the, here was what the, uh, here, was, here was the way the law was structured in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Number one, premeditated murder. Okay, life imprisonment, death or life imprisonment. Number two, second degree murder. Uh, killing someone without premeditation. Not being a nice guy now, but, and then we called it murder three. Number three, wow. and number three says, and, and it's still in the Uniform Code of Military Justice the last time I checked on it, number three says that if a, you, a person, a defendant, engages in activity that is so wanton and willful and so outrageously bad, uh, we, the law will imply intent to kill. So well, that's a tough case in event. Exactly. So here's what happened. The government found itself in a predicament because the military judge refused to charge on first degree murder because of the Korean witnesses. So the government retreated off of first degree murder and went for murder three. That what I'm telling you about. And so the court martial panel either had murder three or they had, and then I'm down here, I'm arguing for involuntary manslaughter, which is a lesser offense, you see, or I'm arguing for, for uh, accident, which is not a crime. So you see where it got, so it got, uh, so the government agreed that it should go forward to the jury from his, from their point of view as murder three. Well, when the case is over, the uh, prosecutor, my friend prosecutor, he got chewed out for conceding first degree murder. And I got chewed out for being, I don't know why, but anyway, that, 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 was, that, that was the case from the defense standpoint. And all of this is when you were a 28 year old first lieutenant, maybe? 26 year old captain. Yeah. Yeah. Tough start, way to start well, the that, Well, that's, that's, you know, <laughs> that's maybe, throw, you, throw you in there and see what I happens. Was, yeah. You asked for the, worst, the hardest one, that's the worst. You had another question that's blown past me. Uh, well, that this final decision was, what well, you just told us, you, what, what was the final? Oh, okay, final decision. They found him guilty, but they sentenced him as though it were involuntary manslaughter. They gave him four years. Well, you did your best. I did. That's all you can do. Yeah. Anyway, that's, well, that's, that's a the, really, that's really that's interesting story. Point, yeah. It's very, in, uh, very yeah. different from uh, a lot of the veterans that had to do it. You know, they're out there maybe out in the jungle, but you're in there trying to defend that young kid from uh, his world that he got put in, and he got ordered there. Yeah, he did. And, and you got ordered there. I did. That's very interesting, Tommy. It's interesting. Uh, was there anything that was there any recreation at all there? Yes, <laughs> I, I, I confess we we had recreation. Uh, we had a place called China Beach. You've seen the TV program, the, the show China Beach? No, but 
Well, it was it made the, it was a show about the, these American nurses, and and they were over to China Beach. But hey, gosh, I never saw her over there. Trust me. <laughs> but we got to go to China Beach and uh, got to go over there. And, and I, hey, look, the place has changed. I want to go back. The place has changed so much. I understand that there are, there are a couple of big fancy hotels now over on China Beach. There's so many people wanting to go back. Maybe it'd be good to take a trip back someday. I want to go. See what it looks like. I don't like. want I will or not, but I, I sure would like to. So anyway, there was that recreation. Well, that's, that's kind of, I want to come back to the United States now when it's kind of, what, 13 months or maybe 12, and then, uh, what kind of aircraft took you back? Okay, and the, the Marine Corps, the, the Army uh, term or uh, normal uh, uh, time you, you spent was uh, 12 months, Marine Corps was 13 months, but by this time uh, President Richard Nixon began to have the drawdown. Mm -hmm. He started drawing people down. That's about 1970 maybe? That was, that exactly, you're exactly right. So, uh, in 1970, I, I knew that I was coming home, but I didn't know exactly when it was. It turns out uh, that, I, that I served a little bit less than a year. I, I said, if you want to be precise, I so, so you were withdrawn by Nixon. I sense. was. Very good. I, I was. I served, if you want to be precise, I served 11 months, 22 days, and four hours. <laughs> In a wake up. <laughs> That's how long I served over there. Yeah. That's amazing. Very interesting. You probably hit, did you go the island trip or back or did you only go direct right to well, Went a different way. Went a different way. This time we, 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 we flew out of there in a uh, American Airlines 707, not a United Airlines Stretch 8. This was American Airlines 707. And then when we flew this time, we flew from uh, Da Nang to one of the American bases in Japan, and then across, and I think we landed at, um, I think I think the end of that flight was was Charleston, South Carolina. I think it was, no, excuse me, it wasn't. I'm sorry, I'm wrong about that. But the end of that flight was uh, San Bernardino, California. The reason, I, the reason I remember that it flashed into my mind was, I was, I, we were in such a hurry to make that next flight to Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So that it well, So would this be the end of your, uh, did you complete your duty upon the Vietnam part? Or did you still no. have to? No, I got to go back to Camp Lejeune for six more months and then I got out. I, that would have been that, the end of my three years. Total time in the military would have been, what do you think? Well, th three years when I went into second time, then I had uh, a, at a PLC. I had three months of PLC, so my total... Three and three. Three and three, yes, sir. Full tour, let's see. And uh, say, uh, let me ask this. I'm, you know how it was in uh, on the television stations in yeah. 68, 69, 70. There was pretty much, uh, in many places, not everywhere, not so much down around here, but maybe other places, there were some not too good a welcome. How was your welcome back? Uh, I was moving so fast, I, I didn't have a chance to experience, well, there was no warm welcome, I'll tell you that, but I didn't, I didn't get the, uh, or as one of my, one of my lawyer friends said, <laughs> said when he landed, he said, I, I met a man who had a spitting problem. <laughs> he got spit upon by some guy, and he put it, he said he met a guy. should have defended him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, I, I did not experience. I did. I didn't expect. But there were people that did. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's because of the region of the country, or was it just like your your community or your friends? Or well, what? well, it was because of the the anti-war sentiment that had built and built and built and built. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy was. Uh, well, then you're running into Watergate, so I guess. Well, we had. Here's what we had. It, it had this happened when I was over there. We had the Kent State thing. That was the wasn't a popular war in '69. Gosh, 70. it was not. It was not popular. And one thing I I, I do want to tell you, uh, this, I don't want, but it, it should be in the record somewhere. Uh, and when I tell this, I got to be very careful to say what I mean and mean what I say. We had racial problems in Vietnam that were, in a word, bad. I can't. I can't. But I can't sugarcoat it. 
We had drug problems in Vietnam, which were bad. Mm -hmm. I've uh, heard that before, and uh, you wouldn't be the first to say that. Uh, I think that's pretty much accepted now because of what they did with uh, maybe Chappy James and Colin Powell were pretty honest about all that. Yeah, yeah. So that's how we kind of know about yeah. it. So you're, you don't have, that's about what I've heard before from yeah. uh, high-ranking individuals. Yeah. Like Colin Powell. Yeah. yeah. So for example, uh, you know, like, how do you think all that affected your whole life through up to now, maybe? Well, well I, I, in a way, what we had there, to a, to a degree, and, but not, not as bad as it was there, is sort of kind of what we got a little bit of now. When we were over there, it was Japan providing all the trinkets, small appliances, and beginning to the cars, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's when it all began. But China was nothing, you know. We had racial problems. We had gun violence, I'm, t I'm telling you, over there. It, it got so bad that the, they put in an order that, like we're talking about, you can't, you can't even chamber, chamber around in your rifle unless you're it's for a legitimate war war purpose. Pretty hard to fight a war like that. Well, it is, especially if you, if you're in a uh, if you're in a uh, really a tense situation. But I, I think they they if you were out on a on a uh, uh, on a, with a platoon out on maneuvers, I don't think that rule would apply. But I mean, just being in an ordinary situ situation, if you chambered around, you could get court martial for it. So we had we had that problem. We had the, the problem of, of foreign competition in in our trade imbalance that was building up. But it was Japan then. We had the racial problem and we had the drug problem. So I'm not blaming everything on that. I'm just saying That's we very we, we got some problems today that were. It reminds me a lot of the problems we had then. So maybe it started then. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I've. I will say this, as far as drugs are concerned, it introduced a lot of young people to drugs who would never have been introduced. Now, they may, they may have gotten introduced later back in the States, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, but, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable answering this, you, as, a, as a lawyer, maybe you could even see this better than most, but what do you think of the uh, young Marine Lieutenant platoon leader then, in your time there? What, what did you, how would you maybe uh, grade that in a sense? He was in a tough spot. He, he, he was in a tough spot. Uh, he's, he's, he's got a racial problem. Yeah. He's got a drug problem. <laughs> he's got the enemy out there. That's a real problem. He can't load his weapons unless he wants to. And, and, and I'm just saying, he was he was in a he was in a hard hard way. Very hard. Yeah. And from what I heard in the news, uh, the north part of Vietnam was pretty much more violent, ran away in Khe Sanh than uh, maybe some of the south even, where yeah. the Marines were. Right. Um, well, when I was there, they, they changed. They, they call these things TAORs, Tactical Area of Responsibility. When I was there, the most northernmost part of South Vietnam was under the jurisdiction of the Third Marine Division. Next, one step down, and the Marines used to be there, but they, they got moved out there. Hundred First Airborne. Next step down, First Marine Division. Next step down, the Rock Marines, was ROK, Republic of Korea Marines. The next step down, the Marikow Division. That's the way it was when I was there. It changed. Uh, so maybe when you left there, Da Nang didn't have many troops around it guarding it because Nixon had been withdrawing, maybe? Could have been well, well, there were fewer. Uh, there definitely were fewer troops now. The interesting thing about it all was, remember, Thankfully, I was not that I was not over there for either Tet One or Tet Two. Tet One was horrific. Uh, the whole country was a battlefield. The 
good news about Ted one that we don't re we didn't realize then was it was a great military victory for the United States. The Viet Cong came out in the open and they got slaughtered. Uh, it, it, it was a military victory for the United States. It was a psychological defeat for the United States. Give the, give your enemy credit. They pulled that off right under our nose. You don't go. You don't have a countrywide assault like they made without planning, without logistics, and they did it. Great tacticians, maybe. Uh, somebody knew what what they were doing. Yeah. But anyhow, well, then the second time, I, 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 I was hushing just to say, the second year was Tet Two, not as bad, but bad. I was there for what we thought were going to be Tet Three. We were kind of, but it didn't happen. And the reason, this is my opinion, it didn't happen was we were beginning to leave. If your enemy is leaving, yeah. Yeah. let him go. Let him go. Maybe let that's him, what happened. Let, that's that's Jarrett's theory of Tet Three that never happened. Very interesting, a wide-ranging interview, and let me ask you just to maybe put a conclusion on this. All right. Uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you actually think you should get out there? You men mentioned one thing you wanted out there. Is there anything else you want to have today to put in that maybe we forgot about? Or I, I can't. I can't think of anything. I, well, I'll step out on another limb, and, and, and I'm the only one I've ever that I've ever articulated this. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but I think I'm right. We, we, we have the, back going back to the racial problem. And I don't have another war to compare it with because this is, was my only one. We had, we had a racial problem, which mo was mostly violence by African Americans against whites, usually against junior officers and, and NCOs. And we had another problem going on that was mostly white Marines abusing Vietnamese populations. What a gamut to run through. I'm, I'm just, just, and I have no statistics. And, that, and that's why this interview is very important because yeah. from a, I don't think there are many interviews with a great legal overview of the things that happened in Vietnam. And from your point of view, you can see all of that from that level, it's really critical. Well, that's, that. I, I called it the chain of violence. That's, uh, that, Good title for a book. <laughs> I call it the chain of violence. Black Marines abusing white Marines who are abusing Vietnamese. You have to think about a book. We've got the title. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. that, that's, that's, I'm off my soapbox now. I'm back down. I'm back. <laughs> no, you've done extremely well. Let me ask you, let me see if I forgot anything we have to talk about here, Tommy. No, I think you have really covered it. You have given us a tremendous view of uh, Vietnam quite different from uh, what we would expect from maybe somebody on the line and out there in the combat hey, world. Hey, you're hey, look, looking at but, the bigger picture. I'm talking about that. Let's give a tip of a hat to the guys who had to go out and do it. You bet. I was not one of them. I agree, but don't forget. So let's... Let, never, never take any, never think down about anything you did there. But I'm not, but I'm just telling you my hat's off to the guys who had to go do it. I can't say it any better than that. Well, you defended them. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Tommy, very much. Thank you. Thank you. You, uh, you just had to defend one that was out there. Uh, and they even have a hard time coming out of maybe New York, out of the city jungle, and then so they, they can't do it as well. So you probably did a very important thing for this. Uh, well, I hope so. I, I, hey, look, I've told the truth as I remember it. Let's put it like that. Well, I think that, you know, they do research. Uh, uh, these people up there in the, uh, let's say, Naval War College, uh, Industrial College, whatever, they do go over and we're told to research certain things. I'm sure some legal officers that are in there in the National Defense Institute, uh, or whatever they call War College, is they're going to send them over there. To find out what it was like on the ground, and I don't think there are many interviews so far with a top-rated Marine uh, legal officer. I don't think we have many of that. Do you know of any in our area? I don't this know. This is the first for me. It could be almost maybe one of three or four in the country. I do, have, I do have one question related to that, if you don't mind. Sure. You mentioned some of the racial challenges and things that you saw. I think you know some of that's documented, but. Um, 
does that mean that some of those racial problems made it to the legal side where you guys had to, to operate in those scenarios where you had to defend or, or deal with people that had committed some of those, some of the violence you're talking about? Yes. Uh, well, Eva, it, 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 and my, the case I described for you, mm -hmm. uh, oh, let, let's, no, let's put that case aside. I don't know whether you want this on tape or not, but in the legal community, this, this is not going to sound good. In the legal community, we had what we spoke of as the mere gook rule. Gook being the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And if the Vietnamese was the victim of a crime, you never vocalized that the victim was a mere gook, but sometimes it seemed like, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the exception in a second, that those kinds of things were not paid attention to like they should have been until, and I was in Vietnam when it came to light, the me lie thing that happened happened down at the mayor cap. When the me lie thing came to light, this is my opinion now. Lieutenant Kelly, right? Lieutenant Kelly. Yeah. When the me lie thing came to light, the whole thing changed. I'm 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 exaggerating. You could do any little thing to towards the Vietnamese, and you could get in trouble for it. But up and I, I, I'm I'm overstating. Yeah. But sounds like politics or even in the military. Well, hey, look, they, they, it went from like, it's okay because it was a Vietnamese to, it's not okay, it, it was, a, you know, it just, it seemed like the, the pendulum just swung. I, I can't, you asked me to prove it, I have no proof. I have an assignment for you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I will put a manuscript of that of your thinking there. It's not on tape. But I can include a manuscript of that. You okay. write it for me. All right. And I'll type it for you. That would be that would be great. You know, we yeah, only have be good. Time to do this and and uh, he brought it out very well. I, I hope we can get that in there somewhere. Yeah. Well that that's just that's an opinion. Sure. Worth what you paid for it. Well when you when you do these interviews, uh, you are free to say exactly how you felt yeah. as a person on the ground in Vietnam, whether you're a lawyer or whatever, and uh, uh, nobody will even try to ever even fact check it because they, they're not required to. It can be, you know, a lot of, could even be exaggeration, they do not care. It's just a matter of getting the record so somebody can go research it someday from a war college or whoever needs it in college, uh, especially with your legal viewpoints on this, it's really going to be critical. Oh yeah, agreed.